so this is talking about the environment and uh, let's see how this works uh, it, with environment uh, we mean basically everything in your surroundings everything that you can see or sense with your other senses in the place where you are playing so the environment would mean sort of how everything looks the props the location you've chosen the scenography that you've added but it also adds things uh, includes things like smells and tastes and feel and the soundscape the sounds that are in the area and it also includes things that are sometimes beyond your control such as uh, weather uh, or temperature or uh, well lighting is oft often in your control except if you're playing outside music don't go under this category music is here as well basically everything in your sensory environment is the environment uh, many of these things you can control, many of these things you can't control, and depending on where you choose to play, of course, influences what, what, which of these things are under your control. Why does the environment matter? Well, uh, first we can sort of ask, uh, where does role-playing take place? Uh, Eric talked about this on Tuesday, uh, when, when uh, he mentioned that there are sort of different uh, ideas of what LARP is. I mean, is LARP happening inside the mind of a player? Is it a, is it a personal experience? It is the experience of the player. Then the environment is not as important. Is the LARP between the players in the player's social interaction? Again, the environment is a little bit more important now, but it's still between the people. Uh, and at this point, for example, how the other person looks, how their costumes are done, becomes be, to be an issue. Or is it action in an environment? Is it social action in an environment? And that's when the environment starts to become much, much more important. Uh, so what kinds of actions does the environment encourage is a good question to ask here. So depending on which, what kind of an environment you're playing in, it will give some hints to the player as to what they can do there, what they can do in that LARP. So what can you see and what can you do with it are key questions here. The fader that I'm introducing uh, goes from 360 degree illusion, which is basically everything looks exactly the way it's, it's supposed to look and you can use it in exactly the way you would think that it would use. So everything works and everything looks fantastic. At the other end you have material independence, which means that it doesn't matter what the environment is at all. So you, you sort of, it, it's just about the players and not, and not about the surroundings at all. And in the middle you have something like clarity and we'll come to that. If, if you're lucky, if you're a good designer, you have clarity there. Things that are, are, are key here are uh, presence and absence of non-diegetic materials. Diegetic means something that is true within the fiction. Uh, so all of those things that are true within the fiction of a, of a LARP, for example, if you are playing a LARP about drinking milk, obviously you probably need to have milk, so the milk would be diegetic, but for example, uh, uh, somebody's old shoes in a corner might be something you ignore that it's not part of the LARP, so that would be non-diegetic. Uh, so what you do with this slider is that this fader is that you remove the stuff that is not supposed to be there and you add the stuff that is supposed to be there. So you remove the noise, uh, the, the uh, noise, the, the, the um, sound noise, for example, if, if you want to play a LARP in peace, you, you, you don't play it in a cafeteria that is crowded by other people because you can hear them talking constantly, so there's actual noise. But there can also be visual noise. For example, if you go to a very old school fantasy LARP that, where everybody has Coca-Cola bottles all over the place, so you need to sort of edit visually out the Coca-Cola bottles from the fantasy. And then you can add elements, like you can add fictional elements, so you can add uh, elements that, that are relevant to the game. So you add something, <laughs> for example, uh, fire bolts or, or magic potions or dragons or, or whatever. So either you, you can remove stuff or you can add stuff. And this is coherence and fidelity. Coherence meaning that it, it makes sense and fidelity meaning that it, it, it matches the vision of what the LARP is supposed to be. It matches the fiction of the LARP. Uh, and imagination is the key tool here. Imagination is what you use both to add stuff, you imagine that there is something there that isn't there, and imagination is what you use when you remove stuff that uh, you see but isn't part of the LARP. Um, 
In basic semiotics, they have a division to, to sort of uh, symbols, icons, and indexes. And this is sort of w when you bring in elements, sort of how do they figure in the LARP. For example, you could decide that, that a piece of cardboard is an apple. The cardboard would then be a symbol of, of an apple. Or you could decide that a picture of an apple is an apple. Or you could decide that an actual apple is an apple. So meaning that that symbol is something that there is no connection between whatever it is that you're using to represent something else. With icon, it usually bears a similar similarity to what you're showing. And with index, there is some kind of a connection to it. So usually when you go up the slider, you're going from <coughs> symbols towards index, uh, indexes. And a key question here is usability. How can you use it? Eric also talked about the affordance, I think it was yesterday. And affordance is something that sort of, uh, it's, it's a property on, of an object uh, that you think that you can use it in a certain way. So qualities of an object that suggest how it is used. Uh, so when you see something, uh, you see something, how, what do you think you can do with it? For example, if we take a screwdriver, uh, sort of what, what affordance is does the screwdriver have basically means what do we think we can do with this screwdriver? So we probably think we can screw stuff with it, or we can use it as an ice pick, we can kill someone with it, we can scratch I don't know, our, our necks with it. But the, uh, another thing about the affordance is, is that the affordance is a relationship between the object and you. So a screwdriver gives different affordances to an adult and to a baby. What, what does this afford to a baby? Probably sticking it in, in the baby's mouth and sort of tasting it, because that's what babies do with everything. But the thing about here is that, of course, this isn't actually a screwdriver, nor is this a pipe. This is a picture of a screwdriver. So what does this actually afford? That is probably sort of we can make, I don't know, uh, uh, shadow theater. And this is relevant because in a LARP, a LARP is not a theater. For example, in a theater play, if we have a picture of a bookshelf, it, it, it's a very easy way that to communicate that probably stuff on the stage is happening in a library. But if you do this in a LARP, if you have a picture of a library, it doesn't afford any use of a library. I can't go there and pick up a book, and we all know that. So if in a LARP you use these kinds of methods, the, the players instinctively understand that they can't actually go there and pick up a book. It's just there to communicate something else. So it, it affords the feeling of being in a library, but it doesn't afford picking up a book or reading a book. So these are sort of things you can do with, with the environment. And the things that you put in the environment, what they do is they focus what you can do. So most LARPs, they have sort of an uneven environment. There are certain things that are much more specifically designed and some things that are less specifically designed. A classic thing in a LARP is that uh, the stuff that you, you do during the day is well designed and then you sleep in a tent or in a, in a sleeping bag somewhere because the sleeping isn't that important. It's not in the focus of what you do in the LARP. So the sleeping is not in the focus and you don't pay attention to it and there's not maybe isn't that much uh, scenography uh, uh, devoted to that. But what you can do is you can use focus to, to sort, of, uh, sort of guide the action of what the players will be doing during the LARP. So if, for example, you have a completely white room and in the middle of it you have a car then probably that LARP is going to be about that car because it's there and there's nothing else. So you can use it uh, to focus. Of course, you can do, use also lighting and sound and all of these things to focus in different ways as well. Getting to the fader. Uh, so at the maximum, we have 360 degree illusion. Uh, it means that we have a visually coherent world which is easy to understand. What you see is what you get. Everything works the way uh, you, it sort of everything works and, and it, it, it is exactly the way it, it looks. Uh, everything is functional, usable, playable. Uh, these, are, these are sort of the positive sides. Also, translating and interpretation is not much of a problem. So, which means that when you see something, you don't need to think for sort of, is that cardboard supposed to stand for an apple? or or sort of, is it supposed to stand for freedom? No, it's just a piece of cardboard. So there's no translation needed. 
Because, for example, the classic example, again, in, in sort of certain um, old school, very old school fantasy games, is somebody has a, 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 a cape made out of cheap cloth, and you don't know if it's a cape made out of cheap cloth, if it's the cape that it's that color, or if it's supposed to be a really brilliant cape. So in 360 degree illusion, it is what it is. It feels real, and it looks awesome in photos. Uh, it encourages nonverbal activity, because when you have a completely functioning environment, you don't need to talk. You can just, for example, when you go and wash the dishes, you can wash the dishes in very different ways, because all of those things are there, and you can, you can bring nuance into your interaction. And it makes you feel important and impresses the players, because sort of usually this is something that, because it looks awesome in photos, and it, it's a lot of work, so, uh, and it's something that players do appreciate. On the minus side, it's less imaginative in the sense that you need to use your imagination less since everything is already there. It's less co-creative. The players can just sort of introduce something that isn't there because obviously it isn't there. And it enforces real world behavior. If you have a complete environment, you will probably try to sort of work in that environment as it, as it suggests. It's also very difficult to play test because sort of Build, you, usually you have the resources to build the environment once. Uh, you can't just build it and test it for a weekend and then sort of tear it all down and build it in another way. So playtesting it is more difficult. It is expensive and it is labor intensive. It, it takes a lot of work to create a functioning uh, photorealistic world. And the weirdest thing is that when everything is perfect in the environment, everything is exactly as it's supposed to be, players sometimes feel out of place. It says everything is perfect except me. <laughs> so, so sometimes, sort of, sort of, sometimes players f feel that sort of now I'm not living up to this environment if, every, if everything is perfect. So that can also happen. Then in the midway we have clarity. So, we, like I mentioned, sort of basically you you sort of you first you remove noise and then you add fictional elements. So in the middle we have absence of noise. There isn't stuff there that it's not supposed to be there. Probably there, there's probably also stuff missing that would be there. And you have a few fictional elements that are highlighted. Black Box is a great example of, the, of this. Of the 360 degree illusion, I think College of Wizardly is a good example. And here, I think the closest we've gotten is New Voices in Art, which if the walls were white and we all had a little bit slightly different clothing, it would, go, it would uh, work as a gallery opening. But so this is sort of the black box thing, where you, you, you start with an empty space and then you just add the differences that you want to, want to make. Very designed, very controlled. So as a designer, you have complete control over the environment. It gives you sharp focus and relevant, ele relevant elements can be highlighted. But this is also sort of the mixed style. So even though clarity is the word that I'm using here, this can be also very messy if you're sort of uh, uh, not... Uh, not uh, 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 conscious of all the choices that you make. The, on the minus set side, this can be just as difficult to set up as 360 degree illusion because it requires such control. You need to think sort of, I'm, can I bring in this cup of water or will it throw off the focus? Uh, it requires more playtesting, but at least the playtesting is easier to do uh, and can, can and end up just as messy. Whoops. And then we have the fader minimum which is uh, a material independence, which means that it doesn't matter where you play. And this is basically Family Anderson that has, as we played it here. We just played it in a, in a random location. Family Anderson played in 360-degree three, style is that we would actually have to have the house and all of those things, like the photo album, should be in the house when we are talking about it. But here we, we just chose to play it somewhere. I mean, this means uh, and the great thing about material independence is that since the environment doesn't really matter, it's great for short scenarios. You can set up a game anywhere and you can play uh, many things in a row. For example, you could play a scenario in a cafeteria or, or in a bus or just somebody's backyard because it doesn't matter what the environment is. So it requires much less uh, physical labor, much easier to stage. Uh, but what it does require, it requires collective focus. Because in order for the players to inhabit the same fictional world, they need to be paying attention to each other. 
and uh, the environment is not there supporting their interactions. So it encourages verbal and social interaction, but it's also a good thing that it requires focus. The players actually need to be present in whatever it is that they're doing together. Focus on social. Uh, but on the minus side, uh, it requires more work from the participants to focus. Uh, harder to sustain with larger player groups. If you have 200 people playing and you have no props that help you tell where you are, it can be, it can, uh, 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 sort of, the, the fiction can start to unravel. Uh, it's difficult to do nuanced... Uh, unravel. Unravel, sort of, sort of... Um, uh, fold to pieces. Uh, fold to pieces. It can start to fold to pieces, yeah. Uh, uh, it's difficult to do nuanced uh, nonverbal interaction. For example, if you're washing dishes and there's actually nothing there and you're just sort of doing the dishwashing uh, movements with your hand, it's, it may be more difficult to communicate sort of how you are doing the washing, for example, which in a 360 degree illusion is easy to do. You can do the dishwashing really badly so that there's still grease on them and you can use that in a game. It's more, much more difficult in a, in a material independent. Uh, LARP. And it's not as impressive, it's not as real, but it is, it is much, much easier to stage. All right. So those are the faders, and there are some, some design questions that you can ask your, from yourself when you're thinking of the environment. First of all, what are the minimum requirements for the environment? When I'm, when I'm staging this, this LARP, what do I absolutely need? Uh, what changes would bring focus and make the interaction more interesting? Uh, what style best fits my vision? And the, perhaps the most important question, what can I and my players actually afford, both in time and in money? Thank you.